rose by 25% over the past two decades. Segregation is still a reality as well, at work and at home. Good morning, good to see you guys. You guys ready for this? Week two of our series called Culture Wars. We're working our way through this Old Testament book, Daniel. We're trying to gain some insight, some wisdom on how to thrive no matter what the circumstance, no matter what situation, no matter what culture you might find yourselves in. And last week we learned that Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were kidnapped around the age of 15. They were taken from their homes. They were taken from their families. They were taken from their country. And they were all brought to this pagan city called Babylon. And I'm not sure if you were here last week, just in case you weren't. You need to understand that this city, Babylon, it wasn't just any old secular city. You see, if you look to the very end of your Bible, Revelations 18, we talked about this last week. It references the fact that this city, Babylon, where these four Jewish boys were all taken, it was the personification of evil. That's how it was referenced. That's what it was called, the personification of evil. You see, this city, Babylon, was filled with all sorts of wicked people. They were doing wicked, horrible things in this city. And that is the culture that these four Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, all had to navigate. See, I think there's a lot that we can learn about how to navigate a secular culture. And just so you understand, we all live, we all operate right now in a secular culture. And so if you're trying to figure out how do I actually thrive, not just survive, how do I thrive in a secular culture? I think there's a lot we can learn from these four young men. So here's what I want you to see today. See, it's impossible to thrive without the right people in your life. You might want to write that down. It's impossible to thrive without the right people in your life. And today we're going to pick up the story, Daniel chapter 3. We are in chapter 1 last week. But before we do, I want to tell you very quickly, you might want to find that, Daniel 3. Let me just tell you very quickly about this study that I read about this week in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm not sure that you read that or peruse that in your free time. It's a very scholarly journal. But I found this study conducted by these two PhD researchers. They're scientists. They evaluated data from 12,000 people who were repeatedly polled, repeatedly interviewed over the course of a number of years. It was actually 1971 to the year 2003. So you got a long period of time. The people who participated in the study, they were originally examined to understand the health of their heart and how that all worked. But then you've got these two social scientists their names were Dr. Nicholas Christakis, Dr. James Fowler. And when these guys come along, they start to analyze this data from a different perspective. You see, these two guys, these researchers, they wanted to understand how different people, family and friends, how do different people actually impact and influence our own lives? 
Let me give you one example. We don't like to talk about this, but obesity. You see, this was one thing that these two scientists started to research. This might surprise you, but according to the research, according to their findings, if a friend of yours, let's say a close friend, becomes obese, are you ready for this? It might surprise you. You are 45% more likely to become obese yourself. It's very interesting. 32 years was the time span of this data. Here's what they conclude. Your friends make you fat. You don't need to write that down. Or maybe you do, right? Maybe you do. I'm just telling you, in this scholarly journal, read it for yourself, New England Journal of Medicine, this is what they conclude, your friends make you fat. Unfortunately, that is not the only influence that your friends have in your life. Apparently, these guys, Christakis and Fowler, they became intrigued with the influence of social dynamics. And so they start to study more broad aspects of social influence. And I want you to hear a little bit of their findings. Again, this is documented in some of the most academically rigorous journals, medical journals in the entire world. So here's a question. Do any of your friends smoke? You don't have to raise your hands, but it, you need to understand that if your friends smoke, according to the research, you are 61% more likely to become a smoker. Now get this. Let's say that your friends do not smoke, but let's say that a friend of your friend smokes. Do you know your likelihood of becoming a smoker? 29% more if just a friend of your friend smokes. What about happy friends? You know what they do? They make you happier. Like 31% happier. Wealthier friends, they make you wealthier. Peaceful friends make you more peaceful. I'm sure you get the point, right? The point is the people around you matter. Right? The people around your life are very important. In fact, there was this social psychologist named Dr. David McClellan. He works and studies at Harvard. He said this, the people you habitually associate with will determine as much as 95% of your success or your failure in life, I suppose, depending on how you define success or failure. But here's the reality. You might not like it. You might not know it. You might not believe it, but you are who you hang with. That's what I've entitled this message. You are who you hang with. And it's so important to understand, especially when you're trying to figure out how to navigate life in a secular so culture, that it's impossible. Like, you cannot thrive. You might survive, but you cannot thrive without the right people in your life. So with that in mind, let's go to God's Word this morning, and let's see how this plays out for Daniel and his three friends. I said we start in chapter 3, but just in your Bible or your phone, scroll back two verses. Let's start in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48 this morning, just for a little bit of context. Here's what it says. It says, then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, this wicked pagan city, he placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Verse 49 says, Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So that is the end of Daniel chapter 2, and I would give you some homework. Right This week, you go back and read the whole of this chapter. It won't take you very long, but just so we're all on the same page this morning, let me give you a quick synopsis of this chapter. You've got Nebuchadnezzar. We talked about him last week. He's this pagan king, and Nebuchadnezzar, this king, has a dream. Right, And the dream is bothering him, and he can't figure out what the dream means so he calls, in this chapter, all the smartest people in his kingdom. He starts to call the sorcerers. He calls the magicians, right? It's a pagan culture. He calls the enchanters. He calls the astrologers. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king, he assumes 
that if these guys, the sorcerers and the magicians, the astrologers, the astrologers, they can't figure out his dream, well, nobody can. But what you find is that this king was wrong. You see, all of these people that he calls fail, but that's when this young boy, he was a teenager still at this time, comes along. His name is Daniel. And Daniel interprets the dream. So I want you to see Nebuchadnezzar's response. Look at verse 48 one more time. It says, the king placed Daniel. This is his response to Daniel interpreting the dream. He places Daniel in this high position. It says that Nebuchadnezzar made him the ruler over the entire province of Babylon. So now Daniel is in charge of everyone and everything. You see, that is the response of this king to Daniel interpreting his dream. He's now over all things and everyone in the entire kingdom. You can think of it like this. Daniel is now the prime minister of Babylon. That's kind of like the modern day equivalent. He's the prime minister. And I guarantee you, Daniel, growing up in Judah, this Jewish province, never thought to himself, one day I am going to be the prime minister of the most pagan, wicked city on earth. But that is what has happened here in Daniel chapter 2. It's a very interesting turn of events for this young Jewish boy. So notice, what is the very first thing that Daniel does as the new prime minister of Babylon? Right? Does he throw a party for himself? You can look at your Bible. Does he put this out on social media? Does he announce his promotion? Does he go out and immediately buy a new camel for he and his family? See, he doesn't do any of those things. Look at what Daniel does. Daniel is placed in this position of power. He's got potential to do almost anything that he would want to do. And the very first thing that Daniel does is he chooses to surround himself with three specific people. You know their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's the first thing that he does. He's got power. He's got position. He's got the ability, the potential to do anything he wants. And Daniel, who understood this principle that you are who you hang with, immediately, first action, surrounds himself with these three people. Let me show you why this is so important. Now we get to Daniel chapter 3. Look forward. Daniel 3, it says this. We won't read the whole chapter this morning, just a little bit. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. It was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. Just kind of get a picture. I don't know how high this ceiling is, but it's probably, what, 25, 30, 30 feet? You were here when it was constructed. So it's triple the size of the ceiling, this image of gold that this king has. And it says it was set up in, on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This king, he then summons the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all these different provincial officials to come to this dedication of this image that he had set up. I won't read all those names again, but in verse 3 it says all those people decide to come to this dedication. They assemble in front of this image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And look at the word. It says they stood before it, right? So get this in your mind. This is the picture. You've got all these really important people, and they are all standing in front of this golden statue, right? That's what the picture is. Verse 4 says, then the herald loudly proclaimed... This is what you are commanded to do, O people, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, all kinds of different music, when the band plays, that's the point, fall down, worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. So that's a very interesting story here, beginning of Daniel chapter 3. Let's just understand what's happening. You've got, again, Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, wakes up one day and decides to himself, he thinks to himself, you know what my people would really benefit from? <laughs> I mean, everybody in the kingdom would just really benefit if there was a solid gold statue of me. 
constructed somewhere in some kind of plain, some kind of open area. And he, it, you might not have caught it in verse 1, it, it's, it references Adura, right? Adura, we know, uh, in this region of ancient Mesopotamia, was like a walled-in area. Adora was probably an area that was somehow surrounded. So it was a, an open plain, but it was enclosed, maybe with some mountains or some kind of wall. And so the king calls all the most important people. And I read all their names, the magistrates. There's actually eight different types of governmental officials, everyone who was anyone. And they all show up, and they're standing in this field, and they're standing in front of this golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's when somebody says, here's the deal, right? This is all you have to do. When the band starts to play, you heard all those different instruments, right? When the band starts to play, what do you do? Bow down, right? Everybody in the field, everybody in the plain of Dora, the band plays, just get on your face and bow down and worship the statue, right? And it was really simple. Right? And it was, it was really straightforward, and I want you to know it was totally socially acceptable in this culture that practiced polytheism. Right? Everybody worshipped all sorts of different gods, small g. Right? So they're all bowing down and worshiping all sorts of different types of gods, and so when the band plays and they're told all you have to do is hit the floor, it was easy. It was really simple, right? Everyone is going to do it. Everyone together, right? They're going to hear the band play, and nobody's going to question. That is, of course, unless you're Jewish, right? Let's look at Exodus chapter 20 very quickly. Exodus 20 records the 10 most uh, important commandments for any Jewish person. Here's the first commandment. You probably know it. Here's the list. God says, First command, you shall have no other gods before me. Right, last week we talked about boundaries. This was the very first boundary constructed for every Jewish person. No gods before me. It's a clear biblical mandate. Nothing higher, nothing greater, nothing more important than the Lord. The most high God is the very first commandment. And this is why... This scenario that we're looking at is such a big deal. It's a problem for these three young Jewish boys. Who are they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is a big, big problem. See, we're not actually told where Daniel is. Did you notice that? Daniel never appears in Daniel chapter 3. It's weird because it's entitled his own name. He never shows up. We don't know where he is. He is the prime minister. He's maybe off on official governmental duty somewhere else in a different land. But we're told his three friends, they're all standing in the plain of Dura on that day with all the other Babylonian governmental officials. It wasn't just anybody standing in the plain of Dura. It was everyone who was anyone in the kingdom of Babylon, including these three Jewish boys. And so these three young men, they had a choice. Would they stand up for what they believe, or would they compromise? It's an important word. Compromise and bow down. That's the, that's the choice. That's the question that they had to answer. Stand up for what we believe, compromise, and bow down. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about our culture, and I realized it's the same choice that we have to make every single day. Do we stand up for what we believe or compromise and bow down? See, I'm guessing that you probably aren't tempted to worship any 90-foot statue of gold, but I wonder, do you ever worship the idol of acceptance? See, I wonder what you're willing to do to gain acceptance or approval at work. I wonder what you would do to gain approval with your friends when you go out or, or even at home. See, there's all sorts of different type of idols that we might worship in this culture. What about the idol of comfort? What are you do, willing to do in the name of comfort or pleasure 
the idol of pleasure. You might not think of these things as idols, but that's what they are. You see, an idol by definition is anything that we place before God. Make a note of that somewhere. An idol is anything that you put in front or before God. And so here's the question. Is there anything worth more to you than God? Right? Because if there is, then you've got some idols in your life. Not little miniature golden statues, but you've got some real idols that you're going to have to address. And I want you to think about this question. Is there anything worth more to you than God? Because it's an important question. And there is a standard answer that you've probably got in your mind. It's two letters. <laughs> no. Right? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, of course, there is nothing more important than God to me. See, the question is, and the reality is, we live in a culture of compromise. And so the problem is, in this culture of compromise, that it's so very easy when faced with a challenge, do we stand up for what we believe or compromise and bow down? It's so easy to look at some of these idols, some of these things that we place in front of God and actually start to worship them. Let me give you one quick example. And I shared a little bit of this story a few years ago. See, a few years ago, I was doing a training course, facility, facil facilitating a training course in the country of Nepal. And I was in the capital city, Kathmandu, and I'm facilitating, facilitating this course. That's a hard word to say. F f f f facilitating this course for all these Christian leaders. You should know there's 40 million people in this country, Nepal. Less than 2% of the 40 million are Christian. 96% are Hindu. You know, there's 330 million gods, small g, that the Hindu faith believes in that the Hindu faith worships, 330 million different gods. And so you've got a very small but growing Christian population in this very large Hindu country. One day I'm visiting this influential pastor, probably one of the most influential pastors in the entire country. Now there's not many Christians in the country, but he's an influential person in this small Christian community of faith. We're sitting in his home, we're there on the floor, which I was told was the kitchen. Somebody else told me that it was the bedroom. It happened to be the bathroom. I'm not sure how that works, but it was the bathroom as well. You see, it was a one room, literally one room space that we're sitting in. And we're all sitting there eating food with our hands from this same little tin plate. And we're kind of sitting there on the floor. There's no chairs or anything. And that's when I'm like, just trying to get to know this guy. So I say, hey, pastor, tell me what type of work do you do? You see, in a very small Christian country, pastors actually have to work other jobs to support their family. So every pastor, it's a normal thing. Every pastor is working another job. So this pastor looks at me and he's, he's kind of like a little bit sheepish for some reason, but I wasn't sure why. And he says, oh, I work with handicrafts. I make handicrafts. I'm like, wow, that's pretty interesting. What type? I thought it was a normal question. What type of handicrafts? do you actually make? What is a handicraft? I'm not sure. I guess you make it with your hands. So I'm like, what, what, do you, what do you make? And he's not wanting to answer, but I wasn't picking up on what he was throwing down. So I keep asking, what type of goods do you make? Right? And I keep kind of, my wife would tell you, I kind of can hammer on something. And I'm hammering, just tell me, what do you make? And so finally, a few minutes later, he comes out and he's got this little thing. I want to show you a picture. It's this thing. Do you know who this is? This thing has a name, Ganesha, right? This is the most popular of the 330 million little gods that they worship in Hindu culture, right? His name is Ganesha. And for some reason, lots of people bow down and worship this little statue. And apparently, that's what this guy makes. Little elephant Hindu gods. Right? And so we're all sitting there on the floor and we're eating our food from this little tin plate. And I look at this guy and I'm like, hold on. Like, I'm literally in shock. I'm like, hold on. You are one of the most influential pastors in this country and you make little Hindu gods, idols? 
And you might be thinking to yourself, this is crazy, right? I was thinking it's crazy. The craziest thing is he didn't see the problem. It was literally crazy to me. You see, what I came to understand is this pastor's dad made idols. And his dad's dad made idols. And his dad's dad's dad made idols. And all his friends made idols. And so everyone around this pastor made idols. But just because everyone around you is doing it, does it make it right? No, right? And so I'm just sitting there listening to this and seeing this, and it might seem obvious to you that you shouldn't make gold-plated elephant idols. But I wonder, right? We don't know those type of people, but I wonder, do you know anybody who gossips? See, if you were thinking to yourself, I've surrounded my life with all Christians, so I'm good, I want you to understand, you might be a Christian and have a problem with gossip, Do you know anybody with a critical spirit? Do you know anybody who likes to boast just a little bit too much? See, the people around you matter, especially when you live in a secular culture. We all live in a secular culture that says anything goes. We talked about this last week. This culture that we live in says everything's relative, everything's subjective. Everything is open to interpretation. Here's the problem. When you live in a culture like we live in, and all day long you're surrounded by opinions and actions that aren't congruent with God's word, it's so very easy, remember that word, to compromise. Do you think that my pastor friend, who's one of the main pastors in this country, wants to dishonor God? No, that wasn't his goal. But he's surrounded by people telling him all day and showing him all day that in the eyes of everyone, this behavior is completely acceptable. You see, that is the problem for us. So often we look around and everyone's doing it and everybody's saying it and everybody's thinking it. And so we think to ourselves, it can't be that bad. But listen to how King Solomon puts it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He says, if you walk with the wise, what happens? You become wise. Walk with the wise, become wise, associate with fools, you're going to get in trouble every single time. You walk with the wise, you're going to get wise, you're going to get smarter. You associate with fools, trouble is coming. 1 Corinthians 15, here's what Paul says. Same thing, different way. He says, do not be mis- misled. Bad company, you probably heard this. Somebody probably said this to you. Corrupts good character. See, here's the reality. You're going to get tired of me saying this this morning. You are who you hang with. I love how this entrepreneur, his name is Jim Ron. He's kind of been popularized for, for kind of summarizing this idea in a certain way. Listen to what this guy says. He says that all of us are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. So this guy says, if you show me your friends, then I'm going to show you your future. Right? You're the average. Think about that. You are the average And I'm not a mathematician, but just do the sum. You're the average of the five closest people in your life. See, it's impossible to thrive if you don't have the right people in your life. So here's the question. Who are they? Who are the five most important people in your life? And this morning I thought, let's just do a little exercise. It won't take us very long. Pull out your bulletin. Something to make a note on. You could take a note on your phone. I expect everybody to participate in this little exercise. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. This is an exercise for you and you alone. I want you to write down the five people who come to your mind. Who are the five closest people to you right now? Are you ready? Get set. I'm going to be counting 30 seconds. Write down five names. Go. This is good. Nobody's talking. Everybody writing. 20 seconds left. Don't look at your neighbors. Make your own list. These are your five closest people.
Keep going, 10 seconds. I'm not sure if it's a li literal 30 seconds, but it's close. Okay, that was roughly 30 seconds, and you don't have to tell me who's on your list. I want you to know if you struggled with this exercise, so did I. It's very interesting how that kind of goes. Our entire preaching team, we did this exercise this week, and we were like, wow, it's kind of difficult to name the five most important people. But here's the point. See, I'm guessing as you look at your list that some of us need to audit our friends. I'm guessing that some of us probably need to take an inventory. Right? I think some people would phrase it like that. Take an inventory of the people that we've surrounded our life with. See, for some of us, we're going to need to decide whose voice is most important. If you want to thrive in culture today, you've got to decide whose voice is most important because what you find is that the people around you matter. And that's why Daniel, his very first action, he's the new prime minister of the most wicked pagan city in the universe. His very first action is he gets the right people around his life. He surrounds himself with men of godly character. Men with strong conviction. And so I want you to see what happens when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are told, you're going to have to bow down. Right? That's, it's simple. You're going to have to bow down. You're standing in the plain of Dura with everybody else, all these government officials. You guys bow down. I want you to see what happens when they're told to do something that these three Jewish boys knew was against God's law. Let's pick up the story. Daniel 3, verse 13. It says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they're brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? It says, now when you hear the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harps and all these different instruments, the music and the band is playing, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well then, very good, says the king. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Not a good alternative. Then, I like this question. I think it's such an interesting question that reveals the heart of this king. He says, then, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? You see, this pagan th king thought of himself as the, the supreme authority. It's very interesting. He says, I'm going to throw you into the fire unless you bow down and worship me. If you don't, who's going to save you? Very interesting. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I love this. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. You see, I want you to make a note here. These guys felt no need to justify their perspective. I think that's a problem for us. So often when we're operating in this culture, when we want to stand for what we know to be true, we feel like we have to justify the reason. Do you ever feel like that? We feel like we have to give a reason for our actions. And what we find with these three guys in the most pagan of all situations is they're like, I love how the NASB translates it. It says, we do not need to give you an answer. You see, there was one voice that was the most important voice for each of these three young men, and it was God's. So look at the end of their response to this pagan king. Verse 17. They say, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king, but even if he does not, right? Here's what we want you to know. Even if God doesn't show up, even if he does not save us on this particular day, O king, we are not going to serve your gods. And we are not going to worship this image of gold that you have set up. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
they stood before this pagan king. And they refused to bow down. But I want you to notice that these three guys, three, were all standing there together. Did you notice that? We're not told what would have happened if any one of them individually would have been standing there alone. We know that the three of them were standing there together. And we're not told if there was some kind of internal dialogue amongst their friend circle where one of them was like, I really don't know, guys. It's not that difficult. Let's just bow down. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to notice. Everyone's doing it. We're not told what the internal dialogue was. We're told that these three guys are standing in one of the most wicked scenarios that they could be standing in, and together they were able to resist to stand and honor God. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter four. Verse nine says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity, pity, feel sorry for the man who falls and has no one to help him up. See, we're better together. You might have thought that that's just something that we say around here. You might thought that was just like a nice little catchphrase that you hear at church. It's not. This is a profound biblical truth that you need me and I need you because we're better together. Together, they stood in front of the king. See, if you want to thrive this side of heaven, we need each other. And you probably know the end of the story. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't happy. (laughs) That's to say the least. So what's he do? He orders that this furnace is turned up. Turn up the dial, right? Heat it up. The furnace, seven times hotter. It was so hot that the soldiers that were ordered to throw these guys into the fire, the soldiers caught on fire and died. You know the amazing thing about this story? That didn't happen to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, these three guys... The soldiers all die. They walk right into the center of the fire. And they're standing there, and we don't have time to kind of talk about the fourth guy and this whole foreshadowing. They're standing in the middle of the fire, and it's miraculous because they don't burn up. And so I started to think to myself, I wonder what might happen if you and I were just a little bit more intentional about choosing the people who surround our life. What might happen? You see, here's what I know. Your friends make you fat. You had to know I was going to come back to it, right? It's not ideal if we're talking about our physical health. It's not ideal if we're talking about our weight and the exercise program and this new Daniel diet that somebody out in California invented. The reality is your friends make you fat. And, you know, I don't know if you know this about me, but I played a little bit of sports and I was a professional athlete once upon a time. And I kind of like to be fit. I'm not the most fit anymore, but I like it. But I thought as I was reading this journal that I'd let you in on a secret that only a few people know about me. See, I have a goal, and it is to be fat. You're wondering where I'm going with this. I once heard these three letters, F-A-T, described as an acronym. You might have seen this, heard this, read about this. But when I read it, I thought, man, that is my goal. Uh, that That is my ambition. See, these three letters, F-A-T, they stand for faithful, available, and teachable. And so a number of years ago, I decided that's my goal. As a follower of Jesus, this is what I want to be. This is what I aspire towards. I want to be faithful. I want to be available. I want to just be teachable and walk through my days fat. See, I hope that's your goal. But I want you to remember you are who you hang with. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. This is a very practical message. This series is going to be very practical. See, this week... I want you to go home because it's so important that you audit your friends. So I want you to go home and and carve out a little bit of time to take an inventory about who are the people that surround your life. 
You see, some of us, we're going to go home and we're going to figure out that we have got to do a better job of guarding our inner circle. I think some of us are going to have to make some hard decisions about whom we spend our time with. Some of you need to go find a mentor. It's as simple as that. Go out and find somebody who's just a little bit further than you on this path, this journey of faith. Some of you need to prioritize certain voices over others. I'm not saying you need to cut out all non-Christians. That's not what I'm saying this morning. You need to decide whose voices are most important in your life. Last thing, parents, grandparents, let me tell you one of the most important prayers that you can pray for your kids, for your grandkids. I've been praying this prayer, not because I'm some really ultra holy guy and I get everything right, but I've been praying this prayer from the day that my son was born. It's very simple. God put the right people in his life. One of the most important prayers that you can pray as a parent as a grandparent, as a great, great grandparent for your nieces, for your nephews. It doesn't matter if you care about these people that you're praying for. Pray, God, put the right people in their life. You see, the people around you matter because it's impossible to thrive in this culture that we live in without the right people in your life. So can we pray this morning? Let's pray. Father, this morning, we, your people, gather because we want to grow in faith. We want to grow in knowledge. We want to grow in love and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, we see fairly clearly from your word that without the right people, this journey is going to be very, very difficult. And so, God, my prayer this morning for each of us in this room and watching online is that you would help to guard our lives, to surround our lives with the right people. That all our days might be spent worshiping the one true and mighty God. All God's people said,